السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <تصفيق> اعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين <تصفيق> والصلاة والسلام على سيد الخلق والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا <تصفيق> فعلمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه واجعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه وأدخلنا برحمتك في عبادك الصالحين آمين So today's story or today lecture inshallah will be divided into three categories So the first one I would like to just remind all of us, remind myself about the big events which we are heading to and that is the month of Ramadan. And the month of Ramadan is a very emotional and a big opportunity for everyone. Try to get the best out of the month and to be a winner in that month. And the month of Ramadan is the month of maghfirah, forgiveness. And it includes the night of power, Laylatul Qadr. And it may, that month could change your life, could change your destiny. You can go from that month to a different level with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So because of the importance of the month, it's also very important to start preparing yourself for that month. And the preparation, the companions, radiallahu anhum, they used to prepare themselves for the month of Ramadan, six months ahead of the month. And while the scholars, they said, start from now, from the month of Rajab. And they said the month of Rajab is the month of planting and seeding, while the month of Sha'ban is the month of watering, and the month of Ramadan is the month of harvest picking. So you cannot do good and you cannot do what you plan in the month of Ramadan if you didn't prepare yourself from now and train yourself from now. You cannot immediately and suddenly stand 20 rak'ah doing taraweeh, reading one juz every day. You're going to be tired, you're going to be exhausted. And this is a normal behavior from a human being. You know, everyone who wants to do something or a big event, he has to plan, he has to prepare, he has to train himself. So this is just an uh, invitation for all of us. Try to train yourself for what you are going to do in the month of Ramadan from now. So the second thing, which I would like to speak about is just a comment about the previous uh, story. I couldn't hold myself not to mention this. You know, the previous story is about a voice among the clouds. And that fellow who hear the sound coming from the clouds. Can you imagine how many names every day is mentioned in heaven. How many names? Maybe your name, maybe my name, his name, her name. Many names is mentioned in the clouds. One time Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, he come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he say, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Then Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Wa alaykum salam the one whom Jibreel told me about him. So Abu Darda was amazed. Does Jibreel knows me, Ya Rasulullah? He said, yes. Nobody knows you on earth, but you are well known in heaven. And that's what we need. We need to be well known in heaven. You know, when the Surah Al-Bayna was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
just before the Fajr Jama'ah. So after Fajr, the Prophet ﷺ went to Ubay ibn Ka'b radiyallahu anhu and he said, Ubay, Allah has ordered me to recite this surah to you. So Ubay was surprised. He said, does he mention my name? He said, yes, he mentioned your name. Then Ubay cried. This is a big event when Allah mentioned your name. And not in front of none, just in front of the angels, in front of Al-Mala' Al-A'la. When Allah is mentioning your name, look to the honor you have with Allah and among the angels. That is my comment. I couldn't hold it. I, you know, do your best to keep your name mentioning there in heaven so that, so that you will be always with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your name will be, will be repeated among the angels. How we are doing that? By zikrullah, reciting the Quran making zikr, tasabih, and so on. That is the best way your name will be mentioned there. Plus, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, whomever mention my name among a people, I will mention his name among a better than those people. So, do what you can. Remind people about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always mention your name with Jibreel, Mikael, and all the angels in heaven. So the third part is the story, and I will try to rush with this story because the end of the story is your part. You're going to tell me the story, and I will tell you how. So today I want you to interact with me. So... The story of today is very famous story. All of us knows about it. It's not something we didn't hear about it. Just for, for your, you know, for your, um, uh, let's say, convenience, I, am, I want you to uh, believe and I make sure what stories I'm bringing to you, it's all authentic. I'm not bringing any, any weak narrations. It's all authentic. So be sure that what you hear is, is authentic story. So the importance of the story, not only what is the story, but the benefits and the analysis which we are getting from this. And this is what the companions, radiallahu anhum, they took out from the story. This is how and what they understood from the story. So today the story is talking about how merciful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is... The, the total or the outcome from this story, which all the dua, dua they used to tell about it. But indeed, there is more deep meanings from this story. And this story is narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu. He said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there was a man from the people before you. And when the Prophet ﷺ used to tell a story like that from the people or from the nations before you, most of the time he's talking about Bani Israel. Most of the time. So a man from the people before you. He said, ﷺ, he killed 99 person. He killed 99 person. And then he asked about who is the most knowledgeable man on earth. Then they told him that is a man and they directed him to a monk, a monk, a priest who is worshipping Allah in his small temple. So he went to him and then he asked him, do I have a tawbah? Can I repent to Allah to forgive my sins? Then that worshipper told him, you killed 99 person and you want to repent there is no way you can make repentant and you cannot get the forgiveness then that killer he killed him and he make him the hundred person and then after a time 
He asked for another time, show me the most knowledgeable man on earth. And then they show him a scholar. He went to the scholar and he asked him, I have killed a hundred person. Is there a tawbah for me? Will Allah accept my forgiveness? Accept me and forgive me? Then he said, who can stop you from getting the forgiveness from Allah? No one. But if you really want to repent, you have to leave the area where you are living in. Go to that village. And it is a little bit far. Go there. There is a good people living there. And you will repent yourself. You will find yourself there. So he traveled to that area in the midway of that area. In the middle, the angel of death come to him. And the angels of mercy come and the angels of punishments come too. So keep in mind, I'm just refreshing your mind. When someone is dying, the angel of death, the angel of death, Malakul Maut, his role is to take the soul. But he is not doing anything else with it. There is a group of angels coming with him. Those people, or sorry, those angels, they are the one who is taking care of the soul. So either it's the angels of mercy, if he's Salih, or if he is not Salih, then there is the angel of punishment. So those two parts, two angels, two groups, they come to him. So the angels of mercy, the Prophet wasallam, they said, he come repentant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking for forgiveness. He come forward with his heart. But the angels of punishment, they said, he didn't do anything for Allah. He did nothing. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent another angel with the shape of a man to be the judge between them. And then he said to them, measure the distance between him where he is now and the village of good people. And measure the distance between where he is now and the bad people where he left that village. Who is closer to him? Then the angels will take him. So if he's closer to the good village, the angels of mercy will take his soul. If he is closer to the, to the, to the uh, town of bad people, then the angels of punishment will take his soul. And then they start measuring it. And they found that he is closer to the good village. So the angels of mercy took his soul. Now this is one narration. And then Imam al-Hasan al-Basri said, this also narrated to us. This is another narration reported by Imam al-Hasan al-Basri. He said, when he was dying, he moved his chest forward. So he moved his body an inch. He moved his body an inch towards the good village. And then in another narration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered the land between him and the good village being shortened and the land from him and the bad village to in, enlarge or extend. So the story here ends. How This is how the Prophet وسلم, narrate, uh, uh, reported and told the companions. عنهم. Now, there is few characters in this story which we want to take the wisdom behind it. And first one is the killer himself that suddenly he starts thinking to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants to quit what he was doing. And that is what Al-Imam ibn al-Qayyim uh, named it as the wake up moment. Wake up moment. This is the first step in change. In, uh, if he wants to change. So the first thing that you need to wake up. So 
It could happen with any one of us if we are doing some kind of repeated sin or repeated bad habit. We want to change that bad habit. We have to realize that we are doing something wrong. If we want to change, then we have to admit that I am doing something wrong. I want to change. Now, the second thing which we are really concerned about, that this moment comes for you, it's either because Allah has drive for you something to remind you. Maybe someone die. Maybe some of your relative get sick. Maybe something happen which drive you to wake up and think about yourself. What shall I do? Shall I continue or I have to do some changes in my life? I have to do better. And then if you take it as the killer did, he took this moment and he activated and he start working for it. But some people, when it comes to him, for example, uh, I want today to give sadaqah. Then the shaitan will start coming and attacking, you know. Okay, sadaqah now is okay, fine, good. Do it after Maghrib, do it after Isha, then the day is gone and he forget it. So this is the way we postpone what we want to do. And when we postpone, either we forget or the shaitan makes us forget or we get busy and we just forget about it. So that's the bad thing about it. When you try to do the change, and you cannot make it, then there is two ways. It's either because you are not really awake. You don't have the real, you know, uh, you know, the real thinking that you are doing something wrong. Or you have something, you know, you prefer it and make it more priority than to do the changes for what you want to do. And like this, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he told us, means Allah will change your heart. If you're really not serious about the change, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change your heart to make you forget. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, either he don't like the way you do it, فَثَبَّطَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he don't like the, the kuffar, the fasiqeen. So when they try to go with the Prophet sallam in the battle of Tabuk, but they don't like it, they are not prepared and they are not serious, they just talk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَكَرِهَ اللَّهُمْ بِعَاثَهُمْ فَثَبَّطَهُمْ Allah hated their action. That's why Allah pushed them down. So we don't want to get into this level when we want to do something good. So do it. Don't wait and don't delay. Take the action and do it. Like this killer, he did it and he make it. Now, another person, another companion, his name Amr ibn Uqaysh, radiyallahu anhu, he is the nephew of Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, radiyallahu anhu. The, this companion was a businessman in the time of Mecca. And he was dealing with riba. So when Islam started and the battle of Badr and so on, so Muslimin, they become stronger, he still didn't accept Islam because he's scared about his money. He's going to lose his money. So when the battle of Uhud started, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised this feeling that I want to change. I want to do something. So he went to al Madina. So when he reached to al Madina, he's asking about his cousins. They told him that your cousins, they are in Uhud with the Prophet sallallahu So he went to Uhud and there he found the fighting is, is going on. So he took his sword and he started fighting with the Muslimin. So when the battle is over, so the Muslimin start looking who is killed, who is murdered. So they found Amr ibn Uqaysh among those who are deeply injured. So they, they ask him, what are you doing here? We didn't see you at the beginning of the battle. Why you came? You came because you are fighting with Quraysh? 
He said, no, I come to fight with the Muslimin. I become Muslim. So they took him to get some treatment at his, at his cousin's house. And he passed away there. He died. So they asked the Prophet ﷺ about him. He said, he is in Jannah. Imagine, he didn't do one rak'ah. He didn't pray. He didn't do hajj. He didn't read Quran. He didn't do any. But he was honest. The change comes to his mind and he used it and he make it happen and he went. He found the fight and he fight with the Muslimin and he was killed among the Muslimin and no one knows that he is a Muslim. Subhanallah. This is how the change can make and the, and, and the result is awesome. Result is big because you are doing something to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine what Allah will respond back to you. Immediately, the Prophet ﷺ said, he is in Jannah. He gave him the guarantee. He is entering Jannah. On the opposite side, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, Quraysh asked him to go and challenge the Prophet ﷺ about his da'wah. So Al-Walid told him, oh my nephew, the Prophet ﷺ, oh my nephew, you have corrupted my, our people. You change their minds. People, they start against each other. So will you stop what you are doing? If you want anything, we can give you whatever you, you want. Then the Prophet wasallam he said, did you finish? Did you finish? He said, yes, I'm done. Then the Prophet wasallam said, will you listen to me? He said, yes, I will listen. Because the Prophet already listened to him. So he's, he, the Prophet ﷺ start reciting Surat, Surat Fussilat. And Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, when he hear, he couldn't, he couldn't, you know, reflect. He hear and listen until he said, please stop. I cannot take it anymore. Please stop. When he finished, then he went out. And there, Abu Jahl, the leader of Quraysh and other leaders, they are waiting and looking what is going to happen with Al-Walid. And you know, Al-Walid ibn Mughira was one of the elders of the big leaders of Quraysh. So when he came out from the Prophet ﷺ house, Abu Jahl said, by Allah, his face is different than the face when he went to see Muhammad wasallam. So they asked him, what happened with you? He said, leave Muhammad and his, and his business. Leave him alone. They said, why? He said, by Allah, I hear from him a word that is not a word of a human or a jinn. It is above your imagination. It is full of fortune. It is a treasure. And it is full of meanings. You cannot challenge it. Then Abu Jahl said, look to what you are saying. Are you corrupting our people? And then the next day, Abu Jahl went to Al-Walid and he said, O oh, Abu Al-Mughira, we are collecting you a lot of money from all the leaders of Quraysh. He said, why? I am rich. I don't want your money. He said, because yesterday we hear what you are saying. So maybe you want to become more richer. So we are giving you some giveaway money. He said, no, I don't want anything. Then Abu Jahl said, then you have to speak something against Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Then Al-Walid come out and he said, he is a magician. So he changed his mind because of the position, because of the title in Quraysh. And the other story is about Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt is well known, kafir. And he is, the Prophet Sallallahu named him as Aswa al qawm He's the worst one in Quraysh. So what happened with Uqba? Uqba, he's Arab. And he has all the characters of Arab and generosity. So one time he was eating. So the Prophet Sallallahu was passing by Uqba. So Uqba called him, come and eat with me. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, I, I cannot eat with a mushrik. You are kafir. Then he said, you have to come. 
I am eating here and you pass by me, you have to come. Come and eat with me. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, I will not eat with you until you become a Muslim. So Uqba declared Islam and say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he sat with him and he ate with him. So after he finished, the Prophet ﷺ went back. So Uqba ibn Mu'ayt, he met after that Umayyah ibn Khalaf, one of the big heads of Kufr, Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And he told him the story. He said, I become a Muslim. I eat and Muhammad come and he refused until I become a Muslim. So I declare Islam. Then Umayyah, he said, are you serious about it? He said, not really. Then he said, listen, from now on, don't ever talk with me and don't ever come to our majlis. If you really want us to respect you again, go and spit in the face of Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he did it. That's why the Prophet sallam, said he is aswa al qawm. He's the worst one. See, sometimes the opportunity comes to you to do some changes, to change something, bad habits or a sin or whatever. When it comes, hold tight to it. Don't let go. Because if you let go, it may never come back. May never. Now, the hidden criminal. Do you know who is the hidden criminal in this story? It's not the killer. There is another criminal. No. The monk, unfortunately, inshallah, will talk now. But the hidden criminal is the one who told this killer to go to the monk. That is the hidden killer. He sent the killer to a monk, not to an, a scholar. He said, this is the most knowledgeable man on earth, while this man, he's just a worshiper. He knows how to pray, how to make dua, how to make tasbih, but he don't know about the knowledge of fiqh. He don't know. So that's why that, that priest or monk, he becomes so emotional when he hear that killer, I killed 99 person. What? You kill 99 persons and you want to repent? Go away. Who's going to forgive your sin? He was so panic. That's why the killer, he looks to him and he killed him. That was a, a, resp a response for the behavior of the monk with him. But the hidden killer was the one who told the killer, go to that person. He is the scholar. While he wasn't a scholar. And then... That gives us a hint that make sure whenever you want to ask someone, make sure whom you are asking. Don't ask anyone. You see somebody is praying, somebody is good. Don't ask him. Make sure before you ask because it's your religion. As the Prophet ﷺ told Mu'adh ibn Jabal, O oh Mu'adh, your religion, it's your flesh and blood. Look how serious is our religion. It is more important than our flesh and blood. So be careful whom you are asking. Don't fall into the same trap like this person. One of the stories in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there was a three companions traveling. So one of them, he got hurt in his head and he was bleeding. So they sleep on the, over the night. And over the night, because of the cold, so he get to Janaba. So when they wake up, they want to pray Al-Fajr. So he said, I have Janaba, what shall I do? Then his two peers, they told him, you have to make ghusl. He said, shall I put water? They said, yes, you have to. That is the ghusl. Then he said, if I put water, it may hurt me. So they said, we don't know anything else. You have to do it. Otherwise, you're going to miss the prayer. You cannot pray with Junub. Then he put the water and he passed away. He died. So they took him to the Prophet wasallam, And they said, Ya Rasulullah, this is what happens. Blah, blah, blah. They told the story. Then the Prophet's response was what? He said to them, you killed him. May Allah kill you. You killed him. That's it. Because they have no knowledge about the deen. That's why they just say, yeah, you have to do it. 
So they did it and he, he was killed because of the infection. Subhanallah. So that's why it's so important. Know whom you are asking. Know whom you are asking. And then the important thing about the killer that again he asked for the most knowledgeable man. Which means that in his heart he knows that there is tawbah for him. There is forgiveness from Allah. But he wants to hear it from the scholar. He wants to hear it from someone who knows about the deen. So that's why he focused and he intend to continue and ask. And ask again and again until he get into that scholar. And that scholar, he was so smart. He told him the prescription. The prescription was very clear. You want to repent? Allah will accept. But one condition. You have to leave and depart your, your, your village. Why? Because your village is full of bad people. Bad people make you stronger. If you want to quit, they won't let you to quit. They will encourage you to do more. So if someone is smoking and his friends is smokers, if he want to quit, you have to quit those friends. You have to stay away from them. Otherwise, you're going you gonna to quit today, you will come back tomorrow. And so on. So that is the wisdom behind it. You have to quit. You have to change. You need to change the environment around you. And then we all know about the big, the big meaning about this story. How merciful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Al-Quran, he mentioned so many, so many categories, which you cannot say that those people, they, Allah may forgive them, but even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he give them the opportunity to repent. Like the people who say, inna Allah thalithu thalatha. The people who declare that, that God is three. So we all know that this is something, you know, kind of hurting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing hurt him subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah said in the hadith Qudusi, Shatamin ibn Adam. Bani Adam has sweared me. And he's swearing by declaring that I have a son. That is the hadith. So we know if someone say that Allah is three, that he is insulting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is forbidden totally. And even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told about these people, he said, أَفَلَا يَتُوبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Don't they repent to Allah and ask for, the, for the forgiveness? And another category, those people who fight Islam and they pay their money for fighting the Muslimin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about them, <coughs> فَسَيُنْفِقُونَهَا ثُمَّ تَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسْرَةً they're going to spend their money to fight Islam and they're going to lose their money and their money will, be become, will become a sorrow for them. They will become sad for their money. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمَ يُحْشَرُونَ And those, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named them as kuffar and they will be dumped in the hellfire. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said لِيَمِيزَ اللَّهُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ to distinguish between the good and bad and then وَيَجْعَلَ الْخَبِيثَ بَعْضَهُ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ فَيَرْكُمَهُ فِي جَهَنَّمْ Allah will compile those bad people all together and He will dump, that, dump them in the hellfire. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ They are the losers. And then at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلْ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Tell those kuffar, إِيَّنْتَهُ If they stop, يُغْفَرْ لَهُمْ مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ Allah will forgive everything for them. Imagine this is the maghfirah, the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One time the Prophet ﷺ was looking to the Sabi, you know, the revenues from the war, from the battlefield. There was a woman, she was looking for her child among all the people who was captured and taken from, from the war. So she found her son, small child, she hugged him, she held him and she kissed him. The Prophet ﷺ, when he saw this, uh, this scene, he wants to give a lesson to us. Then he, then he asked the companions, do you think that this mother will throw her child in the hellfire? They said, no way, Ya Rasulullah. They start tearing when they saw how merciful that mother, the passion and the emotion 
This is no way, Ya Rasulullah. Then the Prophet ﷺ comment by Allah. He is more merciful with you than this mother with her child. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How plenty is his mercy. He keep opening the gate for everyone to repent until the last moment. You know, when Jibreel alayhi salam met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and after the revelation of the story of Pharaoh, he said to the Prophet, O oh Muhammad, if you, saw, if you saw me when Pharaoh was sinking, I was throwing the water in his mouth because I was afraid that Allah will forgive him. Imagine, he was afraid, Jibreel, when Pharaoh was sinking that Allah will forgive him because he said, Amantu billadhi amanat bihi banu Israel. He said, Amant, I believe with the one whom Bani Israel believe in him. So Jibreel, he was scared that Allah will forgive him. So he was throwing the water into his face not to continue the belief word. So that's enough for now. Now the question for you. Now, what is the beautiful names you can get out from the story to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Beautiful names of Allah from this story. This is just interaction. Imagine what you can get from this story about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Comments. Al Ghafoor, Al Rahim, Al Kashif. No. Yeah, he's forgiver, forgiving. Al Rahim, Al Ghafoor, Al Rahim. Al Tawab. Right? He repent, he accept the tawbah, and then Al Rahman, it's part of the mercy. Al Afu, forgiveness. Al Kareem. One very important, you miss it. Yeah, we said Al Ghafur. Ghafur, Rahim, we said. So all what you say is about Ghafur, Rahim. You forget the most important one. Tawab, we said it. We already said uh, uh, Al-Jabbar. This is one good one. Jabbar means he fixed the broken one. Not, um, it's not in, in this story, it's not the powerful. No. The meaning is the one who fixed the broken ones. This is called Al-Jabbar. Then another one. Huh? Al-Rahman. We said it. Huh? Al Ghaffar, yes, Ghafur. You still going around the same names. Ghafur, Ghaffar, Rahman, Rahim. Hakim. Hakim could be, but the most one is Al Halim. Al Halim. What is the meaning of Halim? Halim means he is not putting or, or taking or making the punishment immediately. He give you time. Time after time, time after time, until either you repent or you will be punished. So Al Halim. And then Al Latif. Al Latif means he is the one who is arranging things for you hidden. You don't know about it. You don't know. Like your rizq. Allah is arranging the rizq for all the ummah while they are sleeping at home. So Allah bringing the matar, the, the water, the rain, Allah bringing the, you know, the fruits, Allah make things to grow. So Al-Latif, al Al-Latif. Al so he make things to come correctly as he wants in a hidden way and you don't know about it. And then the last one is Al-Hadi, Al-Hadi. He's the one who guide you to the best thing he wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a small and short uh, story, but you can see how many beautiful names we got, how much meanings we got out of this, and because of the time, I'm just shortening. There is more, but Alhamdulillah, that's enough for today. Inshallah, the next next story is a very important and very well of uh, rich of meanings. Inshallah, and everyone will like it. 
والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم اجمعنا على ما يرضيك واجعلنا من المتحابين فيك اللهم اجعل جمعنا هذا جمعا مباركا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده معصوما ولا تجعل منا ولا فينا شقيا ولا محروما اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم لا تجعل لنا في مقامنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرت ولا هما إلا فرجت ولا عيبا إلا سترت ولا مريضا لنا إلا شافيته وعافيته ولا حاجة لنا من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة إلا يسرتها وقضيتها يا قاضي الحاجات يا مجيب الدعوات اللهم بدل سيئاتنا حسنات اللهم بدل سيئاتنا حسنات اللهم بدل سيئاتنا حسنات اللهم اغفر لنا ولوالدينا ولمن له حق علينا ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم بلغنا رمضان وأعنا فيه على الصيام والقيام وتلاوة القرآن اللهم أدخلنا برحمتك في عبادك الصالحين اللهم آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصل اللهم وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك وجزاكم الله خيرا Brother, we have a fresh match. Tea is ready. Kindly help yourself, please.